Bona tarda, primer de tot. Let me first of all thank you, the organizers of CCCB and the EBOC Congress to bring Elizabeth here. I met her back in 2015 and I am a supporter of what she does and now I have the opportunity to have her here. So she is a very special scientist. She brings the science far beyond interdisciplinarity. She's done so many things that I'm going to read her curriculum. La Elizabeth is a computational biologist with an art practice. Her academic trajectory started with a bachelor's computer in science computer, followed by a master's in plant biology and a PhD in bioinformatics from the University of Barcelona. At the center of her work is a fascination with the way living beings interact with their environment. This in inquiry has produced a body of work that ranges from scientific articles in peer-reviewed journals to projects with landscape architects, to work as an artist in environments from SVA to the MIT Media Lab. She has made contributions to understanding how plants respond to the force of gravity, how genome structure changes in response to stress, and most recently has turned her attention to the ubiquitous and invisible microbial component of our environment. Some recent highlights include the design for the bioremediation of a local toxic superfund site, which won a design competition, had an, a gallery exhibit, and a scientific publication. Her work with the MIT Media Lab led to the development of a novel approach to urban microbiome sampling using honeybees, an exhibit at the 2016 Venice Architecture Biennale, and a curriculum for international workshops. More recently, she has worked at the Storefront for Art and Architecture in New York and the Detroit Science Gallery. She has consistently made the tools, software, wetware, hardware, and need to answer her research questions. It's a maker. She currently holds an assistant professor position in the Technology, Culture, and Society Department at the NIY Tandem School of Engineering in New York City. Welcome to Barcelona, Elizabeth. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> and I, she first will explain a little bit what it's possible to explain in 20 minutes for all her works, and then we will have the opportunity to go deeper in some of them and then let you ask questions about it. Cool, thank you. I prepared a few slides to share with you guys. So we can pull that up. Cool, so I'm, I'm very excited to be here and it feels particularly special because as Nuria mentioned, I spent uh, four or five years here as a PhD student at the Universitat de Barcelona. And the CCCB was a sp space that mm, I hold in much, um, much respect and esteem. And this was one of my favorite places to come to see art programming and shows. And so it feels particularly special for me to be here today um, presenting work that I think was um, presenting work kind of at, at the intersection of both art and sciences, but that I can attribute um, programming at institutions such as these that have kind of set those seeds um, for this interdisciplinary practice. So thank you again for having me. Um, so I hold a kind of particular position in that I'm trained as a biologist, a computational biologist, and I hold a position in a design department in an engineering school. And so the projects that I'm going to talk about today are kind of at the intersection of those three different disciplines. So coming from biology, um, also invo involving art practice, and, um, and engineering. And so... Um, at NYU, I run the Laboratory for Living Interfaces. We're interested in environmental microbiomes. So there's this you know, growing body of um, literature and knowledge that shows that human health and well-being is tightly related to the human microbiome. We're very comfortable with the idea that the gut microbiome, for example, is tightly linked to, to human health. What we also know is that the human mi microbiome interacts with and is affected by the environmental microbiome, so micro populations of microorganisms in our environments. And for most of us on Earth, you know, more than 50% of people on Earth live in urban spaces, those environments that we're interacting with have been completely designed by human beings. So everything about this space here, the materials and the floor, the HVAC system, the lighting, all of those um, kind of environmental factors 
have been designed and engineered by humans, meaning, meaning that also the um, microbial metrics or the microbiome of these, uh, of these spaces is also being um, sculpted, is being sculpted by these design decisions and, uh, and therefore also being um, designed, maybe inadvertently designed, but also designed by people. And so what I'm interested in um, and what we work on in our lab is trying to find um, kind of natural experiments in the city where we can draw relationships between abiotic aspects of the environment and the microbiomes that inhabit those environments. So trying to find spaces that maybe have strong selection pressures, for example, um, or real kind of like causal agents where we can interpret the relationship between the built environment and design decisions that have gone into the built environment and the built environment microbiome. Um, and so I wanted to share just a few projects that we've been working on today. Um, and also, so kind of few projects like scientific projects that are coming out of the lab, um, but also over the last maybe 10 years or so, I've been, um, I've been thinking about the fact that this, the scientific method is, is a way of knowing things and it's a very effective way of knowing things that are maybe measurable and reproducible. Um, and kind of the hallmark of the scientific method is that it removes the human from, from the generation of knowledge and that manifests in all sorts of ways. Like, for example, we write papers in the third person. So, you know, the experiment was performed according to protocol XYZ, not me, Elizabeth, with all of my hopes and dreams and biases and preconceived ideas performed this experiment. Um, and so under this understanding that um, science and culture are, are very much tightly related. Um, so for example, cultural paradigms are gonna influence what kind of things we study in the lab, and also scientific discoveries are going to influence cultural paradigms. I found it, um, I found it really engaging to, to develop another type of practice, like another way of knowing. And so I've been over the years developing an art practice that is very much influenced by the science that, uh, that I do in the lab. And so I wanted to talk to you guys a bit about how I see those two things as being basically two kind of um, intertwined tracks and uh, ways of answering similar questions. So one of the projects that um, I'm really excited about at the moment and that we've been working on for a while is um, looking at the microbiome of the Gowanus Canal in Brooklyn. So the Gowanus Canal is a Superfund site, which is um, the name given by the United States Environmental Protection Agency to sites that are um, priority for remediation due to their in, um, toxic contamination. So this is a canal that is um, embedded in a residential and um, an industrial neighborhood in Brooklyn, and that has been um, the kind of the dumping site for toxic industrial waste over the last 150 years. And so um, as far as like choosing natural experiments, this is a, this is a particularly like particularly um, apt uh, case study to study the relationship between environment and microbiome because there's very strong selection pressures here um, because of the, of, the, of the extreme environment from the toxic compounds. And so what we found as we have sampled the sediment in the canal from these, can, like, these types of canoes as you see here, um, is that not only is this environment that from a human per perspective is completely devoid of life and just kind of needs to be eliminated in any way possible, the current plan is to just cap everything with concrete and then call it a day. Um, so not only is this environment actually an environment where microbial populations are living and also thriving, um, but this particular microbiome has, a, has evolved a bunch of really interesting bioremediation properties. Um, and so as uh, it's been able to develop these molecular mechanisms and metabolisms to be able to counter counteract the toxicity um, that it's being challenged with. So for example, it can degrade cresol, which is a complex hydrocarbon, um, fix arsenic, which is a heavy metal, uh, degrade toluene, which is an industrial solvent. Um, and what's interesting is that all of these metabolisms that we can, that we can identify in the kind of 
living, maybe not breathing, but living, res respiring, um, present-day microbiome of the Gowanus Canal can be related to historical data of uh, factories that were in operation um, at this particular site. So that means that the present-day genomic information of the microbiome maintains a history of human intervention at that site. Not only that, but it maybe maintains an even more accurate history of human intervention because, you know, history as it's written by as it's, as it's written by us humans is notoriously um, lacking, right? And you know, history is written by the victors. People aren't going to report the illegal dumping that they uh, performed in the canal. And so I find it particularly poetic in, in that sense that this, you know, the microbiome is maintaining this, this molecular echo of the, of the history of the Anthropocene in this particular environment. And so, you know, from, from like a biologist or biotechnological perspective, you're like, okay, cool. So there's all these interesting metabolisms that have evolved. This is an amazing biotechnological resource. This is something that we couldn't have created from scratch in the lab, you know, you can genetically engineer a certain microbe to do a thing, but, but engineering a whole population of species that are living um, with each other, that uh, encode this whole multitude of functions and also can survive in this toxic environment, that's, that would be very difficult to, to engineer from scratch. And so kind of the, you know, the first impulse is to be like, great, this is, this is a biotechnological resource. Um, and so as we were writing up the manuscript, you know, the, the kind of title that emerged from that is like, you know, bioremediation and biomining potential of the microbiome of the Gowanus Canal. Um, but that really, that really gave me pause and actually made me pretty uncomfortable because what got us in this pickle in the first place is is resources out of place, right? So this, these, this toxic contamination is due to um, fossil fuel energy extraction industries, you know, um, concentrated chemicals. Um, and, so, and so feeling that we were gonna use then this biotechnological, like maybe you can call it green system that we had discovered as yet another resource to exploit, mm -hmm kind of seems like we're just making the same mistake just all over again. Um, and so, so for that reason, you know, so, so for that reason, the, the place that we're at now really is trying to think like, well, how, how can you talk about recipro reciprocity with other organisms? Um, how can you collaborate with maybe other organisms that are, you know, non-human, more than human organisms? Um, it's really difficult to have a relationship or to have a sense of reciprocity when those organisms you can't see and maybe they're not cute and fuzzy like polar bears and bees and stuff and other animals that we like to relate to. Um, so that, those are kind of the, the themes that are coming out from this particular research. And, um, and so as a way to kind of process that, I've been making some art projects around it. And so this is an art project called uh, the Gene Zine. Um, so those of you who were born or you know, grew up in the 90s or before <laughs> um, might recognize the, the practice, the artistic practice of, of, of zines or fanzines. So these are like DIY publications, you know, usually just photocopies copied on pieces of paper um, that uh, serve as kind of um, ways to communicate information within particular subcultures. So maybe you'll have a fanzine for a band or for a music movement or for a philosophical movement. Um, and so this gene zine is, um, is a book-like object um, that, is, that carries information about the remediation potential of the Gowanus Canal, both in text form um, and also in DNA form. So there's DNA extracted from the Gowanus Canal that is embedded in this piece of paper. And so the idea is that you can take this zine, you know, carry it around in your pocket, and um, if ever you find yourself in an environment that has been recently contaminated and is in need of remediation, you can tear out this little piece of paper and embed it in the contaminated soil. And so this is based on the idea that microorganisms are able to absorb DNA from the environment, kind of just hot swap that in, and start using those genes. 
And so, so this gene zine um, was presented at the New York City Tech Zine Fair a few years ago, and just earlier this afternoon, I did a zine making workshop um, in the context of the Evoke conference that was really fun. And so it's a genomic note from the underground serving the subculture of multi-species collaboration. I want to do a translation check. <laughs> Um, I know that I speak very quickly when I get going and I get excited about things. Am I okay? Okay, cool, thank you. <laughs> um, so this was very much a, a map-making project. You know, we were mapping the microbiome of this particular waterway. And when we think about mapping cities, oftentimes the tools that we have at our disposal to collect samples are kind of at odds with the scale of the thing that we want to study. So, you know, usually you use like a, a swab to collect a microbial sample, or in that case for the sediment, you know, we were just collecting maybe a cup full of sediment. Uh, but when you want to try to, to sample the microbiome of a whole block or a whole neighborhood or a whole city, the tools are just kind of misaligned scale-wise. And so this was a project where we were trying to find a way to be able to get microbial signatures from from a large region at a time. And so we were you know, scratching our heads, and so this was working with some folks at the MIT Media Lab a few years ago, and we were like, okay, scratching our heads, like what, what systems already exist in the city where you can kind of collect information from a, from a broad area? And so we thought about sewage, but people were doing that already, and we were like, oh, okay, wait, urban beekeeping is a thing, and honeybees basically do what we were asking our undergrads to do when we were doing, say, a subway project, you know? So they, like, leave their hive or the lab and then run around the city foraging and then come back exactly to their hive to the same spot. And so we were wondering, okay, is there anything about a beehive um, that can give us information about the microbiome of the foraging area of the bees? So we ran a whole pilot study um, and you know, took samples from the outside of the hive, the inside of the hive, um, honey, beeswax, uh, also the debris that accumulates at the bottom of the hive. This pilot was led by Devorah Najjar, a fearless undergrad student who was at Cooper Union at the time. And, um, and so we found out that the debris that accumulates at the bottom of the hive, so basically the little pieces of dirt and dust and plant material that accumulate at the bottom of the hive um, that fall off the bee bodies um, is a source of really uh, rich um, metagenomic or microbiome information. And so um, we ran this study in several different cities around the world, um, New York, Venice, Melbourne, Tokyo. Um, and in Tokyo was where we had the kind of densest sampling. And so what we did there is collaborated with a bunch of beekeepers and um, established um, the microbial signatures of, the different, of their different beehives. And we were able to correlate physical distance, so how far the hives were away from each other, with metagenomic dif distance, so how far away um, or how different those microbial signatures were. So what we're looking at here is a heat map. So on the y-axis, we have a list of microbial species. Um, on the x-axis, we have a set of columns that correspond to different hives, and the color coding represents um, what the relative abundance is of that particular species at that particular spot. So with a high abundance being yellow and a low abundance, low to no abundance being dark green. And so what we can see here is that some hives, does this work, look pretty similar to each other. Those are the ones that are close to each other. And then that set of hives looks different from another set of hives. And so um, we took this data and we rendered some data visualizations and made an installation that was showed at the Venice Biennale in 2016. And so for me, this project was particularly interesting in the sense that you're starting to think of the city as, as a system, like as a holobiont. You're not trying to isolate one thing from another, but realizing that actually the microbes are related to the bees and the, and the microbes are related to the trees and, um, and that you're able to kind of, like in a particular way, study the city as, as kind of a complex living organism.
What was particularly interesting is that when we look at the species and the microbial signatures that these bees were recovering, they were obviously recovering plant-related microbes, which is what you would expect because they're directly physically interacting with plants. Um, but they would also recover microbes related to, say, aquatic environments, if there was a body of water nearby, um, or um, mammals, including humans. And so the running hypothesis that we have here is that you know, these bees, as they're foraging and, and flying around, they're traversing you know, the, the like, microbial clouds associated with these different entities. You know, we often think of microbiomes as measured in separate places as being distinct from each other, um, but it's very much a continuum. It's kind of like um, measuring temperature. You know, I can measure temperature inside this room and outside also, and those are two distinct measurements, but actually those are kind of just two points in a continuum. And so the kind of expression that has arisen uh, to describe that is the idea that, you know, we carry microbial clouds around with us. So I have my microbial cloud and, and you as an audience have your combined microbial cloud and maybe a tree has its own microbial cloud. Um, and so we're interested in map making. Um, in space, so kind of mapping out these microbiomes um, across space. And we're also really interested in temporal dynamics of these microbiomes. And so what we've been looking at recently is the impact of flooding on um, urban microbiomes. So in particular, the, the, what we've been studying is uh, sidewalk surfaces. So. In New York City, like I think many other coastal and also non-coastal cities, um, New York City is experiencing a lot more street level flooding than it has in the past due to climate change. Um, even this last year, this last summer, we had two major hurricanes and major floods. Um, and so in New York City, we have a combined sewer system, meaning that storm water and also sewage water from residences are both drained in the same um, drain system in, um, into a combined system. And so oftentimes when, um, when we have a storm, a storm water event or a strong rain event, what happens is that these drainage systems get overwhelmed and we have uh, local flooding on streets where water is actually coming out of the drainage system. So this is not like tidal flooding where seawater or, uh, or another body of water is kind of overcoming its banks, um, but this is specifically like stormwater drainage related flooding. And so understanding that we have these combined sewage systems, this flood water contains raw sewage. Um, and so I collaborated with um, another colleague of mine at NYU who does um, water treatment and um, and so we ran, we started running this pilot experiment to try to see if and to what extent flood events were changing the microbial composition of sidewalk surfaces and how long did that take uh, to, to resorb. And so we had uh, some awesome high school students who were working with us on this project uh, that you can see here who developed the whole kind of methodology for DNA sampling from this particular surface. And um, so we developed this methodology and then uh, just waited for a flood. And that's a whole other conversation that actually detecting floods and knowing when things flood and how much is actually kind of tricky, which I'm glad to discuss with anybody interested later. But what we saw here is that, so this is our, um, our test site and our control site. So these two uh, sidewalk areas. And so what we saw here for people who are used to looking at uh, dimension reduction plots is that these are our baseline measurements right here, these kind of reddish colors. Uh, this is the first measurement that we took the day after the flood. And then these dots kind of in gray and green color are the progression of measurements that we took up to 11 days after the flood. So you can see that um, the population structure of the microbiome changed drastically after the flood and then slowly kind of inched back and resorbed back to its initial composition. Um, 
And that's, that's due to a couple of different things. So there's some microbes that were not there pre-flood that were deposited there and slowly went away. Um, there's also some microbes who were there in a low concentration or low abundance at the beginning who kind of flourished and grew after the flood and then resorbed. Um, and there was also some microorganisms that were there pre-flood and that disappeared after the flood and then came back. So maybe you were washed away. Um, and so this is particularly interesting to me in the sense that we think of climate change um, with respect to a bunch of different dimensions and different types of ecosystems and systems and infrastructure. Uh, but this project to me is particularly interesting in the sense that it's relating something that's really like vast and complex and global, such as climate patterns, to something that's actually really like concrete and specific um, with relationship to the microbial systems that we cohabitate with in our cities. Um, so for most of these studies, the like canonical tool that we use for this is the swab. And so all of us are probably uncomfortably familiar with the swab by now because having it stuck up our nose way too many times in the last like 18 months or two years now. Um, but when we study, when we're studying something that's in, like an organism that's invisible, like a microorganism, pretty much all of our relationships with that organism are mediated by instruments. Um, and so really the relationship that we have is a relationship to the instrument and not a relationship to the organism. Um, and that's the, that's the instrument that kind of, that people, that, that, that you react to. So like pre, Pre-pandemic, um, when we would go out, like say in the subway to take some samples, people have really strong reactions to the instrument that you're using. So you know, people were thinking like, "Oh, is there an epidemic? And are you monitoring an epidemic?" Or you know, we were even accused of implanting HIV in the subway. Um, and the reaction that's happening really is to this instrument because it's has all of these kind of associations of, of uh, disease and contamination because it's designed as a, in, a, in a medical context and, and like that's, that's specifically what it was designed for. Um, and so it's really, I think, interesting to me as we're trying to maybe evolve this idea of wanting to like collaborate with um, more than human organisms, have these multi-species relationships, um, that in order to enable that kind of collaboration, we need to alter the kind of instruments that we're using. Because really the image on the right is doing the same thing as the image on the left. So taking a handful of soil is also collecting a microbial sample. Uh, but if we look at the image on the right, we have completely different kind of connotations associated with it. You know, it feels, earthy and grounding and, you know, sense of connection. Uh, but from a functional perspective, this is doing very similar things. Um, and so thinking about um, designing interfaces with microbial worlds is something that I'm really interested in from, from an artistic practice perspective. So um, this was a project that um, was a collaboration with Kevin Slavin, who was at the MIT Media Lab at the time, and David Benjamin, who runs an architecture firm called The Living in New York City. And this was a commission by the gallery called uh, Storefront for Art and Architecture, where they asked us to imagine what would it look like on a human perspective if we were designing for micro microorganisms. So on an architectural scale, what does design for a microscopic organism look like? And so we redesigned this facade structure for the gallery and um, using wood as a material, as a like a kind of intrinsically bioreceptive material um, and treating it with this process of sandblasting, which kind of revealed the three-dimensional shape intrinsic to the wood. And, and so kind of similar to how the process of microscopy takes you from looking at something that looks small and flat, and you put it under a microscope, and all of a sudden you have this amazing three-dimensional world. To me, that kind of material process of sandblasting this wood had had kind of an analogous um, relationship of revealing a three-dimensional structure that was intrinsic in the material. 
Uh, we set up a sequencing lab in the, um, in the gallery space using a minion, and over the period of the exhibit generated a bunch of data. Uh, we were really wanting to not display that on a screen, and so we had a pen plotter robot write out the billions of base pairs that we were generating um, with, the, in, with the sequencing data. Uh, and ended up with this with this amazing artifact of these huge you know this huge stack of mylar sheets with the genetic sequencing data written out and, and so as such it was kind of an exercise in translation of scale right like we need to kind of be able to um, have our imaginations you know scale from the human all the way down to the molecular and then back up to the data scale that we're generating um, and so I think one of the things that I'm really excited about at the moment is the idea of interfaces. So maybe building systems that enable these kind of interactions and hopefully reciprocal interactions um, with microbial species. And so I think there's one particularly compelling example of this to me in, um, in the sense, or with, with this particular example. So Pseudomonas syringae is a microorganism that's a plant pathogen, and its method of pathogenicity is um, secreting a particular protein that is able to nucleate ice crystals at warmer temperatures than normal. And so what it does is it freezes plant tissue, and then the frozen, and then it, it basically eats that, uh, that frozen plant tissue, that degraded plant tissue. Um, and so this is a protein that's used commercially to make fake snow. So like those big like snow cannons um, that make fake snow on the ski slopes when there isn't like snow otherwise to, to ski, that's using that particular protein. Um, but there's this hypothesis that, um, that rain dances, so practiced by native peoples um, over, you know, over time immemorial as a um, actually work through this particular phenomenon of bioprecipitation. So these rain dances that last days, you know, would be able to kick up this plant material and these microbes and their proteins and slowly float up into the appropriate part of the atmosphere um, where they're able to nucleate ice crystals, so make clouds um, that then lead to precipitation. And so I think that as we're talking about um, microbial relationships and the biotechnological advances around, you know, harnessing the power of microbial production. Um, a lot of that conversation feels like, um, like this is like a new technology that is arising out of kind of Western civilization, right? This is an invention of, of our era. Um, but I think it's Im important to acknowledge and remember that there's an ongoingness to this relationship that we have between humans and microorganisms. You know, we have never not lived in a microbial world. Microbes were around way before multicellular organisms evolved. Um, and I think that as we're trying to think about how we can change our relationships, so maybe change the relationship of um, like the, ex ex extraction of natural resources, we can look at sources of traditional ecological knowledge um, to understand how those relationships have actually been maintained and maybe very intentionally so over time. Um, and so, so this ongoingness, there's many examples of this on ongoingness. So for example, you know, we can think of ritual practices as being interfaces, multi-species interfaces. Um, this ongoing, this, you know, making microbial maps of cities is not a new thing. This is a map that Dr. John Snow made in the mid-1850s during the cholera outbreak in London, where he colored in the houses uh, where that had an outbreak, and then with that data visualization was able to identify that the houses that had been, um, had had cases shared the use of a particular wells, and upon closing those wells was able to curtail the outbreak. Also, as part of our ongoing relationship with microbes, fermentation is an extremely um, important example. And I think what is interesting here, and this is a text from the 1700s that I found in uh, the British Library a few years ago, but here they're talking about how um, the phenomenon of transformation of, you know, malt to beer or juice to wine um, was not considered was considered to be a property of the vessel so a property of the container that had been created with its particular material and its particular shape and, 
and not really a property of the material itself. Um, and so I think I'll leave it at that. I teach classes at NYU kind of all around these topics, both from a scientific perspective and methodological perspective, but also from a more kind of um, theoretical and like speculative design perspective. Um, we participate every year at the in the biodesign challenge that's held at the Museum of Modern Art. Um, and none of this would be possible without a bunch of really awesome collaborators from various institutions and not institutions. Um, and so I would like to thank obviously all of them and you also for your attention and looking forward to a conversation. I'm sure the public is amazed as, uh, as I did. Did I, I go too long? I feel like I talked a lot. <laughs> well, I still have a, a lot of questions of the process that you presented, but I, I know that you are now working in some project that I think is super awesome and super relevant these days, the Green Wall. Can you just explain them in two, maybe three sentences? Oh, sure. Yeah, we didn't even get to that. Um, so that's, that's a project where, so if the understanding is that a, um, a forest-like microbiome is the kind of optimal microbial environment for human health and well-being, um, then the question is how do we make our cities or maybe even so our indoor spaces look more like a forest? Um, because indoor spaces of our, especially our kind of modern constructions that have really tightly controlled um, HVAC, so heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, systems are really devoid of microbes. And so that project is in collaboration um, with some folks at the School of Architecture at uh, Yale University. So there's um, it's a Center for Ecosystems and Architecture and a Dyson's lab. And so there, um, kind of the realization is that there's a really established architectural practice of bringing plants into indoor spaces, which is making green wall systems. And so the goal of those green walls is usually um, maybe CO2 remediation, so like air quality, um, biophilia also, because it makes people feel good to look at plants. Okay. Um, but the thing that we're trying to see is if we can kind of tweak those design parameters, both with respect to the type of substrate that we're using, the types of plants that we're putting in there, and uh, the type of ventilation system that's engineered in it. Mm to see if we can kind of foster diverse soil and plant-related microbiomes and then see to what extent these systems are inoculating spaces around it. Um, so as far as methodological development, obviously that requires a lot of development too to be able to kind of monitor that over time and with the spatial resolution that we want. Do you envision that in normal houses or like in common places which we also share the human microbiome every time that we go in. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this will be something in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think in, in individual homes, it's maybe kind of easier to foster that kind of diversity because you can open your windows and you can have a dog and you can have kind of all of these sources of, uh, of like new inputs for microorganisms. I think the thing that's tricky in particular are like maybe workplaces. Um, office spaces that are otherwise like super sanitized and super controlled environments. Yeah, that's also a question that I, I got and I always have. Like the first time that I saw the picture of the wall, it was like my grandma in my head, and how are you going to clean that? <laughs> and that's what we do. We, we clean all the time. And I think that for you that are sampling around the urban spaces and the spaces that the humans living, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to find where the microbiome is going to be. You, you, you have a clear vision when you go with, with the SAP where you have to sample it? Um, it's actually kind of surprising. Uh, sometimes you think that there's environments that you think are going to be like really good, like kind of dense source of microbes, uh, and they're actually not. Um, and, then, and then sometimes it's the other way around. Um, for example, getting microbes off the sidewalk, super easy. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff. Um, but we've done almost an analogous study, but with vertical surfaces instead of horizontal surfaces. So looking at microbiomes of different types of construction materials on facades of buildings. Um, and it's been actually surprisingly 
void of, uh, or surprisingly hard to be able to collect um, material from that. I don't know if it has something to do with the verticality or sun exposure of that particular spot or water flow or, or something, but sometimes it's surprising. Yeah, also something that Elizabeth maybe didn't translate because she knows too much. It's that the world of the microbiome, especially the urban microbiome or the human built environment, as we say it in the papers, is actually full of questions and void of almost any answer. <laughs> It's always something that you don't know. If I ask you which will be the healthy microbiome for a hospital. That's a tricky question. Um, I know. I think, it, yeah, it's a tricky ch question. And it's obviously I'm not a medical doctor, so I can't make <laughs> I can't make recommendations with respect to kind of prescriptions. But I think what we're realizing is that maybe not so much being prescriptive about very specific species, but we do have an idea that, um, 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 met that diversity is, a, is, a, is kind of a good guiding metric. Um, so microbiomes of very low diversity are maybe, could maybe be considered like riskier environments versus high diversity. So then cleaning is like going in opposite direction. Yeah, there, there's an analogy that I like to think about this. Like, imagine, imagine you have a island with no bird species, and you bring a new bird species into that island, and that bird is going to be super happy. It's going to eat all the seeds and sit on all the branches and occupy all of the ecological niches that are available. Um, and it's going to be able to proliferate. It's going to do really well. But then if you have another island with already a bunch of bird species and you bring in your new bird species, it's going to have a lot harder time because it's not going to like be able to eat those seeds and sit on those branches. And, and a lot of those ecological niches are occupied. And, um, and so if you think about indoor environments, you can also think about that that from a perspective of low diversity or high diversity. And so if you have an environment that's completely devoid of any kind of microbes and you bring in your own human related microbes with the understanding that you know on our skin and our bodies and everything, we, we have a bunch of potentially pathogenic microbes, but they don't become pathogenic because they're not present at a sufficient like abundance. Um, but if you bring them into an environment and they have no competition, then they're going to do a lot better than if they do. They can overgrow. Yeah. Uh -huh. Then another another thing that I, I I want to ask you is like these specific scientists that are on the design part and also very involved in sci citizen science is what do you envision that need the changes, the cultural designer and mentality changes that we have to try to embed on the population for being more aware of the microbiome and the relationship with the microbes, not only to slave them or kill them all cleaning something. I don't know how you imagine these kind of relationships in the future. Yeah, I think, I think that's the tricky question because it's so difficult to imagine a microbe. And the tools that we have for that imagination are actually pretty limited. Um, because it's invisible, because all of our really our, all of our interactions are mediated by instruments, um, and so so I think that it's I think that that's actually where maybe art and design, and in particular like critical design, is really interesting because it maybe enables us to have different kinds of imaginations. Yeah, in that regard, I remember one one of your projects that I was I was in love with with the, the image because I can't imagine how you go from the super ugly heat map to the <laughs> super beautiful display of information that you have. You you call it popsicle. It was like oh. this rounded, but then you 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 had more and more and more different kinds of visualization of this data. The one that you did for Pato Map, it was like a very nice pictures of New York subway but then you have these bubbles around with the names of the species it was like looking at firework like mm -hmm. fire you cannot stop looking at it what's your mental process as a artist i guess to to come up with these things that's a good question <laughs> um i think i think it's like it's maybe it i i maybe similar to a research process that you'd have as a scientist except the rigor looks different in the sense that, you know, exploring a bunch of options 
um, but also just kind of playing with things. Um, I think the one that you're referring to, you can also like bounce the microbes yes, around. So can. it's like kind of like a game. And I actually turned that into a game for kids where you could like play basketball and like bounce them into the test tube and figure out their name. This, this is awesome. I, I mean, for the people who are used to see the heat maps, it's okay to, to look at it, but you don't get as excited as if you see. And I guess if I have to explain it to my grandma or my my kids, then I prefer your visualizations much, much more. And I guess this also brings me to the, the final, I guess, question before I let the public ask a little bit more is, also you got a, um, you got a, lot, of, a lot of scientists, not, not scientists, like citizens that are approaching to you for doing science and they collect the samples for you. Mm -hmm. Do you have this sometimes science, the, the scientists has this fear that they will not do it well mm -hmm. or they will not perform as good as we do it or they contaminate the sampling or whatever. But then you come up with a bench of designed DIY kits for forging microbes mm -hmm. and expose it. And a lot of, I've seen, I've seen how the people play with it and, and enjoy this collection and harvesting of microbiomes. I don't know if you can explain a little bit more of that. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think I really like working with uh, various types of communities. Um, and so those workshops that you're referring to, for example, we, um, we try to just imagine kind of speculative futures uh, as, as prompted, you know, by kind of a few little tidbits of information that I had given folks so that they could imagine like, okay, maybe there's a future where there's no oxygen in the air and you have a face mask where there's microbes that are creating oxygen and that's what you're breathing. Or, um, and I think that what's interesting, what was a useful kind of pedagogical method in that was giving people objects to play with so that they could kind of materialize these imaginations in, in three dimensions without, without the stakes being too high, right? And so you just allow them to kind of like you know, put together a bunch of different materials or like kind of things that you find at the 99 cent store or at the Chino. And then, you know, you put it together in imaginative ways and, um, and then people can manifest their ideas in that way, maybe easier than trying to make a drawing or something. I saw the, the mm -hmm. video was, was cool. So I have much, much more questions, but I guess that it's also time to give the opportunity to the public to ask anything they, they want. Yeah, Nuria and I can talk for hours, but yeah. <laughs> if, <laughs> so. if there's any questions or comments. Yeah. Ah, vale, merci. Yeah, so you, you talk about the, uh, well, thanks a lot for the talk. It was really, really interesting on the debate. And you, you said the, the one of the ultimate goals was uh, to develop multi-species relationship. She, she asked Nuria about the, how to push the relationship with the microbes. Mm -hmm. And this is something I wonder, I guess the first step is to get to know them, know who is there, but then, okay, how, uh, how can we relate to them? And how, uh, would, how can you imagine this afternoon you were speaking about mutualistic relationships or you were asking us mm -hmm. about mutualistic, how could we develop a mutualistic relationship with them or what kind uh, have you thought about this? Um, yeah, for example, in a house. Uh, yeah, I think that um, I think that a, a good tool to think about that is is this idea of of like reciprocity. And so I think that that's there's certain ways that you can kind of think about multi re reciprocal multi species relationships, maybe with respect to plants and animals in a, in an easier way, like stewardship of plants or animals in return for what they're providing us, so maybe food. Um, but I think that the basis of building any kind of reciprocal relationship like that is the idea of close observation. And so so having, having the opportunity and time to actually spend a lot of time with a particular organism. Um, there's one of, one of my favorite scientists, uh, Barbara, McClintock, um, who did a lot of work with maize. And so she kept talking about uh, developing a feeling for the organism. And to be honest, I think that it's really, it, it remains an open question to me what, what close observation looks like 
in the context where a lot of the time the thing that you're trying to observe are invisible. And so maybe that's not direct observation, but observation of, say, downstream consequences, for example. Yeah. Oh, yeah, just going off of that, I think a really great um, analogy is the the rain dance that you were speaking of, because there's other there's ways of knowing, um, as you were saying, and I really like that analogy, um, there's ways of knowing at different scales that don't operate on direct interactions. So maybe we can interact with microbes as partners or in mutualisms as spiritual entities or kind of as ephemeral clouds or, I don't know, as just surfaces themselves. But... Yeah, I thought mm -hmm. that approach. <laughs> yeah, and I and I, and I think to to kind of build on that, I think that you know there has been intentional interactions with microorganisms for a really long time, like our relationship of fermentation, for example, or um, societal practices that translate to preventing disease, um, and those were interactions, kind of, or rituals or habits that were developed with intention in the sense that the the cause and consequence was observed without necessarily understanding the mechanism. Um, and so, so I think that if we can allow us, maybe just allow ourselves to be kind of more attuned to being okay with observing cause and consequence without needing to understand the mechanism, that might, that might be something that could be helpful. Yeah. So thank you very much, first of all. We know that we have the urban microbiome and then the human microbiome, and then it has a key importance in medicine, and it has an importance in its variation, and we know that there are some microbiomes that are uh, very individualized. So the question is, are there any researches uh, uh, studying if there is a relationship between the urban microbiome and the human microbiome? So which is the urban microbiome that is going to make us better uh, in order to prevent some diseases, for example? Gracias por la pregunta. I can translate it in English for the group, or did everybody understand? Uh, so maybe I'll repeat the question um, for the English speaking. Huh? You can go on. The oh, there's God. translation. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Um, so no, there is not. No, there's not. Oh, okay. So the the, the question was um, uh, that we know that the human microbiome is very important for health and well-being. And are there any specific instances that have been observed where the environmental microbiome, in particular, urban microbiome, specifically influences the human microbiome? Um, and so. I would say yes. These are not these are not studies that I have conducted specifically, um, but there's a growing body of lit literature that has um, that has been addressing that specific question, um, and so maybe there's a couple of interesting points to to like highlight in that. One of them being that the human microbiome, uh, the infant microbiome, or the human microbiome is pretty much determined in the first few months of infancy, and so. Um, um, the environmental microbiome in which the infant is growing is very important to establish that human microbiome that then that individual will live with for the rest of their life and that can be kind of modulated and swayed but not necessarily changed um, really drastically. Um, and then there's also been some correlation studies in which folks have studied the prevalence of autoimmune disorders, both in urban environments, um, kind of peri-urban or like semi-rural environments and rural environments, um, controlling for um, population gene diversity, and that have shown that um, there's a higher prevalence of autoimmune disorders in urban environments and that 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 the correlation drawn from that was with respect to the different microbial contexts of those different populations. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Come on. 
Ecco. I have been seeing, uh, we see this uh, like studies uh, on urban microbiomes. Are there studies on forest microbiomes? It's supposed to be so good to for us. Are there studies on it? That's question one. Mm -hmm. Question two, could you tell just a little bit about the citizen science project that <laughs> Nuria mentioned? Sure. Okay. Um, Yes, so forest microbiomes, um, forest, or I guess non-urban microbiomes are being studied in, in many different ways. Um, so that's not my specific realm of expertise, but I think that um, they're being, or they're being studied in ways to kind of try to understand how, um, how soil microbial diversity is affected by diversity of other plants, specifically with respect to advocacy around logging of old growth forests with the idea that, you know, paper logging companies are like, well, a tree is a tree. And if we cut everything down and then plant new ones, it's the same. Um, so there's some advocacy work that's being done around that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also uh, soil microbiomes in the context of agriculture are also super important. And so people are understanding that there's phenotypes or kind of physical characteristics of plants that are due not only to their genotype, but also the type of microbes that are in the soil. So that's also of interest. Um, second project is the Citizen Science Project. So the Guanas Canal Project started as a fundamentally citizen science project. So those were community members who were living around the Guanas neighborhood and also some folks who were at um, this DIY molecular biology lab called GenSpace that's in Brooklyn that's like a full-blown molecular biology lab but not doesn't belong to any kind of academic or private institution. And so those were the folks who kicked off um, the Guanas Canal project. Um, thank you very much for your talk. Um, two questions. Why, why do you um, chose to, to center your work on the microorganisms in the city uh, specifically? Mm -hmm. And another question is that if you, can, if you consider this microorganism as part of the city, um, that, that changes a little bit how you see a city, if you see them a city with this microorganism or a city that is uh, constructed also by this microorganism. Constructed by or maybe constructed for or, yeah, there's probably many dimensions of that. Um, well, to answer the first question, I think that um, there's, a, there's a bunch of reasons why I got interested in urban microbiomes. One of them, one, I think one of the main ones being is that I got really excited about the idea that research that I was doing in the lab could also intersect with, with, the, with life in, a, in other dimensions. And so, for example, working with um, designers or architects or people who kind of make things happen at a, at a big scale in, uh, in the world. Um, felt really like really engaging to me and um, so I think that's one of one of the reasons why I'm, why I'm really excited about it um, I think also from a methodological perspective um, I've had a lot of experience using DNA sequencing analysis as a way of knowing and so that kind of came as a progression from other work that I had been doing in plant genomics and then human genomics um, and so kind of using that as a as like um, as an instrument in a certain way, um, and the idea of being able to know things that were really kind of directly related to both my life and, and others felt compelling. Um, the second question being, do I feel different about cities knowing that knowing their microbial component? I'm sorry. Uh, the microorganism. Are, are part of the city, mm. like um, even though we don't see them, is this part of, 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 of the place we're living and what does this mean for you? I would say, I would say very much so. Um, I would say that actually that's maybe one of the really exciting parts is the idea that 
built environments that seem to be kind of separate from nature and non-living environments, um, realizing that they are actually living in dynamic environments seems, um, is, is really exciting to me. Yeah. Um. Also, I, if I can intersect, I, I got the question. I know, I know that uh, you found a signature for every wagon on the subway metro, oh, that yeah. then you can trace the microbiome. And if you show the microbiome to Elizabeth, she will know which line the wagon was traveling. <laughs> that, I know the paper is about something else, but this is one of the things that struck me the most. And after you did the bees project, do you think that every city can have a microbiome as characteristic as the skyline, for example? As characteristic as the skyline? Oh, that's a good analogy. I like that. That, that would make a good visualization. Postcard um, with the microbiome. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. Abso I, th I think that, uh, that we are understanding that spaces have unique signatures. Um, and there's some work that's been done by kind of international consortiums that are looking at those kinds of signatures in a bunch of cities um, across the world. And so I think just as you know, you can differentiate your right hand from your left hand with your microbial signature. And so I think that, uh, I, I think it's not too much of a stretch to think about different city signatures as well. So when, when you traveled from New York, what you just transported a little bit of microbiome of New York. In my to cloud, our, yeah. Your cloud <laughs> and the cloud of New York to, to uh -huh. Barcelona. Uh -huh. yeah. And I think that I, I'm talking like that because if they are citizens with us, they travel with us, they live with us, we should take them into, into account when we design. That's what uh, they did with the project of the, of the walls. Mm -hmm. Did you then sequence it, what was growing on there or you have plans of... Yeah, yeah. So we're using mostly sequencing-based methods um, for that, and, and actually, um, so sequencing of you know the, the substrate microbiomes and kind of the the tricky methodological part has been getting consistent samples, like spatialized samples from the environment, and so we're prototyping this new kind of passive sensor that um, that is able to kind of passively collect both. My microbial populations, um, but also uh, measures of air quality, so things like VOC, to try to measure a bunch of different things about the environment at the same time. Yes, that's what I wanted to explain it to you, <laughs> because it's, it's super cool. Also, a uh, question before going back to the public is, um, I think it's very interesting how Elizabeth bring the possibility and empowered the people for being harnessed, so harness and harvest all the microbiome, and then they sequence it somehow, and then magically a beautiful picture appears and you know what's there. Do you think that in the future also the citizens could have a device or a way of, of also do all, all the process? So from taking the sample to actually see the picture of what is there. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that there's definitely a future in which I think we, our relationship to microbial environments would be like similar to the relationship that we have to weather, for example. Um, and I think that there's actually kind of interesting analogies that can be drawn between those two, those, those two systems. So, you know, weather involves measuring a bunch of different things at different scales. So, you know, me we measuring weather locally, you know, measuring things like, you know, rainfall and wind and pressure and temperature and, and things like that. And so it's a question of gathering a huge amount of data. And then it's a question of developing the models to be able to then make, make predictions from that data. Um, and so, so, you know, we've had like our relationship to weather has really evolved over time, you know, so it's gone from kind of um, intuitive, relationships developed over time where you know, okay, like if the sun sets red um, and with this kind of cloud, then it's going to rain tomorrow. To then like having um, more and more accurate 
instruments to be able to measure it, but not necessarily a model to be able to like explain it all in relation to each other and to predict it. And, um, and now we have, you know, weather models of the entire earth that allow us to give like super precise prediction and, you know, with like minute to minute and predictions of, of, you know, if it's going to rain and, you know, you get a notification on your phone that tells you like you should take an umbrella. And so I think that where we're at in microbiome studies at the moment is at the point that um, we're able, we're in the like, we have accurate instruments and we're gathering a bunch of data, but we don't necessarily have the models that allow us to integrate all of that and to kind of distill that really complex information into specifically the usable information that you might want to be able to use. So we're not quite at the point of like getting a notification on our phone to tell us to like bring an umbrella or whatever the microbial component equivalent of that would be. Um, but I think we can maybe use that analogy to think about how in the future we'll be able to like distill those really complex data sets of really varied types of measurements into something like predictive like that. Yeah, like add a little bit of lactobacillus in your skin today, it's gonna yeah. be dry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Would be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know if someone else has another question, like before I keep going. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Do you think that the dialogue that you, you started and this reciprocity with the microbial can be extended with other living organisms in the city? I don't know, the rats, the pigeon, the other 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 plants the weeds that grow in, in the soil or yeah i definitely i definitely hope so i mean there's there's a lot of interesting there's several kind of interesting feminist theorists who are writing about that at the moment and, you know donna haraway writes about the tulucine where you know this kind of new um era in which we would have symbiotic relationships with other types of with other plants and animals um and or, for example, um, Robin Wall Kimmerer has written a lot about that also, about native understandings of relationships with plants and animals. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that that's, that that's what we'll be able to foster on all of the different scales that we can imagine. Okay, if, so if, ah, another question. So about the, the I, I was very struck by the, the results from the canal in Brooklyn that you say that you could actually uh, try to understand history mm -hmm. from, from what you got there because it was, you know, telling you what was happening 150 years ago. So have you, do you know if other uh, studies like that are, you know, being uh, done in other parts of the world and how do you think the people from from these other subjects will take this new information. I guess if, if it proves their 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 account of history, it will be fine. But if it contradicts, you know, how history has been explained, how do you how do you envision this this collision? Yeah, I think it could be it could be pretty con contentious or problematic, right? I think so. To answer the first part of your question, there's other studies that have. Um, that have been able to develop or to establish uh, kind of predictive correlations between some abiotic context of the environment and specific gene content of the microbiome, the resident microbiome. So being able to predict things like um, heavy metal concentration, which is you know similar to this, but also things like pH also. Um, and so, so I think um, I think yeah, the idea of using kind of resident microbiomes as a forensics tool is super interesting to me because if you if you think of that correlation so like if there's compound x then there's a microbe that's doing something about it but also if there's a microbe that's doing something like having a particular me me metabolism then there is also then there must be that particular toxic compound that correlation establishes over time right so you it wouldn't be like a super time sensitive thing um, but you could do things like develop um, say DNA based soil tests for contaminants um, to be able to determine what kind of kind of historical contamination they've had which is pretty exciting to me and something that I've thought a, a bunch about but 
I just need a student to work on it, but doing kind of PCR-based tests for, for soil contamination because testing for soil contaminants like heavy metals and um, hydrocarbons is, is really is expensive. Like it costs, you know, even like, I don't know, 50 or $100 to get a test just for like a small amount of contaminants. But running a PCR once you, you know, once you have all the primers and everything is actually really cheap. And so I think as far as like an advocacy tool, it's a really interesting prospect. Mm -hmm. Also, this, this comes back to the idea that you said that you didn't, didn't like or you feel horrified, you said, that the, um, you, you see, we see the, the microbiomes or the microbes like slaves, that they, they develop the tools for destroy the toxics that we put in now, that they are living from that. We want to just put concrete on top and forget about them. Mm -hmm. Or just the other way, when the plastic degradate and mm, microbes appear, everybody's very happy because they come up with a way of cleaning our mess. And then our first idea is to make them do it faster and better. And mm -hmm. instead of just throwing away the plastic or creating it, just took them as, as a slave. Do you think that this kind of, of DNA test that you propose for soil will be also opening a door for saying if they are already taking care of that, just take care of them and do nothing yeah. else. Yeah, I think, I think that's a tricky question in the sense that there's a lot of dimensions to it. And, and in particular, I think, um, you know, it's, I think it's, it's easy from a particular perspective, maybe of privilege to be like, oh, okay, well, you know, the microbes are doing their job, you know, we can just wait. And, but I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of kind of entangled issues with respect to industrial contamination, namely like social justice issues, because oftentimes it's populations who are, you know, historically underserved or minorities who oftentimes live like near or at these sites of contamination. And so it's kind of difficult, I think. I mean, it's a, it's, yeah, it's a really, it's a really tricky qu question as far as what timelines you want to be operating on, because maybe there's families who are, who have been exposed to these contaminants for generations and the best thing to do is to like actually just put concrete on everything, you know, for, in that particular context. Um, so I think it's, I, it's not, it's, it's not a super black or white. Mm -hmm. A gradient kind of, also. Yeah. You love gradients. Yeah. <laughs> so there is any other question from, yes, I saw it now. That's just a quite general question. Uh, I would like to know your vision about art, taking into account your, your scientific base. So what is art for you? Just a bit of, of your, your vision about, about art, that vision of, of communicating science. Yeah, that's, um, that's a good question. That's probably like a, a whole like evening's worth of conversation. Um, but um, I think that I see it as, as like a maybe orthogonal practice to scientific research. I think it's a different set of tools. It has, establishes different kinds of relationships with the things that you're investigating, whether through art practice or through scientific practice. I think that it allows you um, to bring yourself in, into it, which is something that science doesn't allow you to do. Um, and that feels, that feels important to me. Um, I think that it's, I think that it's hard that, I mean, have being, it's just as rigorous of a practice as the, as science practice. And, and both of them, I think are hard to do well. I don't know if I do it well, <laughs> but I enjoy it. Um, and I think that there's, you know, there's different ways that you can see relationships between art and science. And I think that there's kind of different combinations that work with different people for different people or maybe different types of collaborations. Um, I think that um, kind of one version of that is that the role of art is one of illustration. So like taking scientific concepts and like packaging them in a way that they can be legible to the public and, and like making them you know, making them pretty. Um, and I think that there's, um, there's room for that, but I don't see that as being like 
either the like most important or the necessary kind of relationship. Um, because I think that uh, that artistic practice is actually kind of doing its doing its own type of thing, and that it would be it's kind of maybe limiting to see it just as as scientific illustration. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. So maybe a little bit um, selfishly, I because I work as a scientist in a group that we do a lot of research about how we can take a microbiome, select a species, make them to do some bioremediation that we are interested in, and then put it back again. And we do it with a perspective of fitting in them already in the network, in the ecological yeah. network that they, they, they have. But we are working with the Timios. So when I explain that to not scientific audience, mm -hmm. I always got a little bit of confrontation about the Gimios and why we engineer them and all these kind of things that has been going on. Do you have a way for me to answer them that, that may convince them that they already have been that, doing that in the canals of New York by toxifying them or yeah. how you think an artist could answer that question? I think that, I mean, I think that oftentimes these conversations, if you try to take them to a super technical point, a place that doesn't, that's not necessarily effective, you know, so you can explain things that like, you know, these GMOs aren't necessarily going to be more successful than others. And actually maybe they have a harder time because they're spending more energy doing the thing that you asked them to do, as opposed to doing whatever else they wanted to do. Um, you know, you can talk about how domestication of plant and animals is also, like selective breeding is genetic modification. Um, so even, you know, like the um, uh, corn plant that we have now is very different from teosinte, which, you know, from selective breeding. So there's all sorts of technical arguments that you can use that probably would be ineffective when, <laughs> when that's the topic of conversation. Um, I think with respect to organisms, to me, the important idea is the, um, is like, what is responsible stewardship? So like, what is responsible stewardship or like, what is the relationship of care that you can have with these organisms? And so thinking about say the relationships that we have with domesticated animals and how they depend on us now. Um, so that might be harder to imagine with respect to a microbe. <laughs> um, but I think that if you can think about it in terms of defining the terms of stewardship, then may maybe that's a helpful framework. I never try that. I always try <laughs> to point them that they are also suffering the effects of climate change that is our fault. So we may want to do something to also save the microbiome to save ourselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not very successful. Maybe I need a megzine <laughs> because that can make a genzine. <laughs> a genzine of that. That's that's my last question for closing. If no one else champions, is did you got the question about uh, antibiotic resistances when you are doing this of of putting a DNA on a paper and then telling them. If you put that in the soil, they will take that information, you know. Mm -hmm. And did they did this connection, or you try to use it for for explain the antibiotic resistance? Or wait, so is the question is, am I concerned about spreading antibiotic resistance with that method, or is the question like, was that a useful analogy to talk uh, about? Yeah, mm. if, did you? That's a good question. I did, actually did not use that analogy, but that would be helpful. I think that that is one of the contexts in which people have a kind of uh, like a first-hand experience um, with adaptation in that sense. Um, so I like that. That's a good pedagogical ah, tool. That's, that's, that's fair. I thought that you got the, the, the question of someone asking themselves. Actually, I that's haven't. what I do when I, I spread the antibiotic resistance away. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think we are now closing up. It's the call for the final questions. I guess, ah, yeah. Um, but maybe it's a obvious or necessary question. Uh, how do you feel the, um, the COVID crisis has affected the micro 
organisms in our cities or not? Like when we were uh, confined, mm -hmm. we watched uh, more birds or the birds were singing lower because mm -hmm. they, there was not much noise. And do you think it's an inter interesting thing to, to study? How I think it's interesting in so many perspectives. Because we are very yeah. now aware that, that there's um, microorganisms around us. Yeah, much more than before. Yeah, I think that that's I think that that's the most interesting part. I think with respect to this idea of like the kind of slowly emerging idea of how we need to like foster microbial relations and collaborate with them. I think we took like 10 steps backwards from that <laughs> grow kind of like, you know, like little burgeoning idea um, because it's because it's terrifying. Right. And so we, you know, are now you have, you know, industrial disinfection practices in our workplaces. And um, so I think from kind of like a practical perspective, we've taken a lot of steps back and, from that but i think from a like collective not even subconscious but collective conscious or collective understanding perspective i think that now you know the whole world is very much aware of the fact that there's this invisible but ubiquitous kind of biological metric that is related to spaces and so my hope is that that shared understanding once we kind of recover from the kind of the like urgent threat that COVID is now and then the kind of in ensuing trauma from that also is that we'll be able to to you know have this kind of actually shared understanding of the idea that things like design of our built environment affect biological metrics of our spaces and so hopefully from that place then we'll be able to to also kind of make make progress with respect to designing for microbial diversity. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think it's had a huge impact. Also just talking, going back to the idea of infants, I think that probably we'll see, you know, 15 or 20 years down the line that children born at this particular time might have consequences from the fact of being confined indoors, for example. Um, you know, I've, I've entertained a lot of ideas, but I have a lot on my on my plate at the moment. <laughs> yeah. So I think that yes, I would like to ask a question to uh, go back to the uh, cross disciplinarity between uh, science and design and biology and architecture or design. Uh, because um, we see that there is a big uh, comeback of uh, uh, of this metabolic city concept, but this time not only uh, like see seeing the city as a metabolism the, with the pipes and the water, but also looking into the other species in this metabolism. And I think that in your work you have a lot of um, manifestations from students' work that they uh, have designed the wall or other uh, objects that can be hosting mm -hmm. uh, species. Um, how how do you imagine like the future of design in the city? Uh, would it be somehow that our built environment would be having these biomimetic structures that uh, can be fertile to th such environments? Yeah, I think there's a couple of ways that we can think about that. Um, one of them is kind of relating to an, a term that has emerged, which is bioreceptivity. So thinking about bioreceptive environments. So environments that both maybe from their material structure or material composition, but also three-dimensional structure are able to kind of host diverse microbial populations. Um, and as far as like, the design and architecture practices. I mean, what I would love to see is like a grasshopper plugin that predicts what kind of microbiome you're going to have given your 3D model, right? And so yeah. I think that, <laughs> you know, designers have a bunch of metrics that they use. Like you can measure light and you can measure temperature and you can measure airflow and you can measure CO2 concentration and all of those things you can like model according to a 3D model that you make given materials and shapes and things like that. Um, and so I think I see 
the future as being, you know, the biological metric being just like just another metric in your like drop down menu. <laughs> so um, to wrap up, I want to thank Elizabeth for answering all of this. For all the people who's living in Barcelona, I have maybe a good news that maybe in April, June, we will release a map of a lot of microbiome sampling that we have been doing around the city thanks to the money of the Ayuntamiento de Barcelona. I want to thank publicly the girls that make that really possible, the guys that work in the Air Lab in EIS Global, Silvia and Lydia, and the girl that works with me, Ariana Bruguera, who has not been able to stay here today. But uh, we were being encouraged for people like Elizabeth to like, take this huge challenge and try to make this data available, a little bit of more data in the wall of data of the microbiomes. And for the people who live in the city, this will be available, I think, June will be more safe to say. Uh, in the website of Fab Lab Barcelona. And with that, I want to give a huge applause to Elizabeth for all this interesting knowledge that she brought with us, together with her microbiome. <laughs>